defilement is one of those those words, one of those Buddhist concepts that people here in the West tend to resist. There's nothing defiled, there's nothing dirty about their minds, they'll say. And of course that's the defilements talking. The defilements have lots of ways of hiding themselves, covering themselves up, justifying themselves. And it's one of our duties as meditators is to learn how to see through those justifications. Otherwise the meditation, the practice, just becomes one more way of providing a tool for the defilements. So you've got to learn how to recognize them, you've got to learn how to deal with them. And so this is where you learn how to use desire to cure desire. In other words, you try to foster skillful desires in the mind, because the mind isn't totally defiled. As the Buddha once said, if the mind were totally defiled, there'd be no way you could develop it. But realizing that it does have its brightness, it does have its moments of clarity, you learn how to take advantage of those. So you can compare them with other states of mind. Try to develop a state of clarity in the mind so you have a point of comparison. Things are clear, things are calm. Learn to appreciate that, learn to develop it. So that when greed sneaks in, or lust, or anger, or fear, you can recognize them before they become full-blown. You can begin to say, hey, there's something not quite right here. The mind that used to be so clear is beginning to get a little murky. And try to regard the clear state of mind as normalcy in the mind. Ubhaska Gi talks a lot about this, getting the mind at a state of normalcy. And some people misunderstand it. They say, oh, well, she's talking about just your ordinary old state of mind. But she wants you to develop a different state of normalcy. The mind, when it's clear, when it's not involved with greed, anger, and delusion, that's normalcy for her. When it's just observant, watching what's going on, when it can see cause and effect clearly, that's the state of normalcy you're trying to move toward. That's the state of equilibrium you're trying to establish. And learn to regard that as equilibrium in the mind. So when the mind goes back to its old ways, you begin to recognize that even though they're habitual, they're not normal. They don't have to be normal. So develop an appreciation for the still moments in the mind and learn how to string them together so they do feel more and more normal, that this is the place where the mind really does get a state of equilibrium. And then from that point of view, you can look at these other states of mind and realize that they really are defiled. They, they're like clouds over the sun. But they're not just clouds. They come with voices. They come with arguments. Every desire as it comes into the mind has its ways of justification, because after all, lots of different desires are thronging for your attention, and they have their ways of attracting their, your attention to them. And at the same time, they try to disguise the results of where these things are going to lead. And often we're in collusion with them. That's what you've got to watch out for. In fact, that's a lot of overcoming delusion comes right there, is learning to see where you are in collusion with your desires. Learn to recognize that fact and then just drop that allegiance you have. We really are devoted to our greed. We really are devoted to our lust and anger, our fears. It's like being in collusion with thieves who want to rob us. We open up the doors of the house, welcome them in. Part of us knowing that they're going to steal our goods, and part of us pretending that we don't know.
So you've got to look for the stages by which these attitudes sneak into the mind. The more solid your concentration, the more easily you'll see the, the incipient stages and the little arguments, the hype that comes along with the defilements, and realizing they're not always going to come the same way. each time they come. So you've got to be prepared with lots of different arguments. This is where the analytical part of the meditation comes in. Say when lust comes in, sometimes you're focused on the objects, sometimes you're focused just on the, the physical feeling of the lust, the sense of excitement, arousal. Many times it's a combination of all these factors, and what you've got to learn to do is to take them apart. One is look at the object, really look at the object, and not just with the eyes of lust, but look at it from other points of view as well. This is why we have that chant in the 32 parts of the body, to remind yourself that inside every human body there's all this stuff, all that blood and all these bodily fluids. And yet when we focus on lust, we pretend that these things are not there. We blot them out of our minds. So learn to unblot them, to see that the object itself isn't really all that attractive. But that's just the first line of defense, because the object is not the problem. The problem is in the mind. The mind's willingness to deceive itself, to thinking that lust is a good thing, something you want to you want to work toward, it's something you want to encourage. So when you can peel your attention away from the object and focus it more on the, the actual feeling of lust in and of itself. This is where you can start looking at the mind's ways of playing along with the lust. For example, showing no concern for future results, saying all I care about is what I can feel right now, or what I want to feel right now. And ask yourself, if you really love yourself, are you going to let that attitude take over? If you do, you're setting yourself up for all kinds of suffering down the road. And the part of the mind will say, I don't care. And you have to learn how not to identify with the I don't care attitude. It's like people coming and whispering in your ears and telling you to throw a rock in your neighbor's window. And then when you go ahead and do it, then they run off, and you're the one stuck with the problem. This is just one example. There are lots of different ways that we can justify going for lust or going for anger. And we've got to learn how to pull back the curtain that delusion throws up around these attitudes to see what's really going on. What are the arguments that are being presented in the mind? What are their rationales? And to what extent can you really identify with them? Many times we identify with things simply because they, they come so quickly. We believe them because we can't examine them. They just flash through the mind. And those little flashes can be really really persuasive, a lot more persuasive than a reasoned argument. And this is why they put all those subliminal messages on TV. Or like that time in The Exorcist where there was such a one little flash of something you could hardly see. It happened only once in the movie. It was the most unnerving part of the whole film. Because those things you can barely see, you tend to embroider. And the part of the mind which is already willing to go along with those things just takes them as its justification, but you missed, or you just barely saw whatever it was, barely heard whatever it was. And it's funny, the, the less clearly you hear things, the more persuasive they are. So you've got to learn how to 
insist, okay, if we're going to go for something in the mind, we've got to have good reasons. I want to hear all your reasons. That's what you've got to tell the mind. And when you demand reasons, the mind will be quiet. Say, okay, if you're going to be quiet, then we're just going to sit here and meditate. Then you'll try to sneak around with something else. But you've got to hold your ground. And there's no one list that will tell you all the good qualities you've got to bring up or all the strategies you've got to develop. But fortunately, when the mind is really still and it's alert to the fact that, okay, it's got a problem here, there are defilements in the mind, they really should be examined. The more quiet you can make your mind, the more likely it will be to think up strategies to counteract these things. So you don't have to go around with lots of lists or lots of prearranged strategies, because the mind is really good at sneaking around things that are prearranged. But if you keep your mind still in the midst of all this movement in the mind, that stillness puts you in a position where you are more likely to see through a particular argument or to catch sight of little subliminal messages that the mind is sending itself. See them clearly for what they are and provide the antidote that you need. In other words, you want to put the mind in a position where it can think up new responses that the defilements don't expect. If you've got everything all listed out and prepared, it's like submitting your battle plans to the enemy. After all, they have a few cards up their sleeve. You've got to have some cards up your sleeve as well. In a good, alert, mindful state of concentration, is the best source of all your strategies. So what this boils down to, of course, is the fact you've got to keep working on your concentration in all situations. At the same time, be willing to use that concentration in all situations as well. In other words, you don't just refuse to think, because a state of concentration that refuses to think is an easy target. Try to develop the kind of concentration that is willing to think up alternative strategies, willing to think outside the box a bit. so that you don't get boxed in by your defilements. This is why the Buddha taught the Dharma the practice in clusters of qualities. There's no place where you say just one quality will take care of everything, even when he talks about mindfulness as being the one quality that's always skillful. It has to be used in conjunction with other qualities. Alertness, discernment, right effort. The concentration is the heart of the practice, but it's a concentration that has to include right effort and right mindfulness in order for it to be right as well. It has to include all the factors of the path. So that you have all the tools, all the weapons you need to deal with defilement from no matter which direction it comes from, no matter what its tactics, you need to be alert enough and resourceful enough that you can think up new tactics of your own. <laughs>